Most people usually save this for the end of the video, but I'm going to put it up here so that if nothing else, this gets out. If you or someone you know is considering self-harm or suicide, there is help available. Now, down in the description, there are some phone numbers and links to websites that can help you or the person that you know get through this sort of dark time, which is pushing them further and further to the brink. Help is out there and it's worth taking, because the people who are left behind are the ones who suffer the most, and nobody wants to inflict that kind of pain on the people that they love. So again, if you or someone you know is considering self-harm or suicide, please check out the relevant links and phone numbers below. There are resources available at your disposal 24-7. The help is there, so take it. So I suppose let's get on with this. If you can keep your head when all about you are losing theirs and blaming it on you, if you can trust yourself when all men doubt you, but make allowance for their doubting too, if you can wait and not be tired by waiting, or being lied about, don't deal with lies. There are a few topics which trouble people's minds as deeply as suicide. Now, philosophers, for instance, have been considering and pondering the morality and the justness of this forever. Even back as far as Epicurus, who was most widely known for espousing a sense of a philosophy which said that the best path to a good life is good friends, good food, not quite hedonistic, but to live a good life. Yet even with this, it was sort of thought that if a person is living a life so devoid of pleasure, so wrapped in misery, that they're right to end their own life and their own suffering is something that is completely just. And this was something that Schopenhauer even um, picked up and ran with later on down the line. Uh, Camus was famous for saying that the central and singular most important question when it comes to human philosophy is that of suicide. So we've been thinking about it quite a lot. And in this day and age especially, when we see that in some cases and in some places, suicide is the first or second leading cause of death among certain young people. When we hear um, MRAs and the like talk about how male suicide is an epidemic that's going unaddressed. All of the ways in which we approach the topic itself, the topic itself remains one which people oftentimes have a great deal of trouble thinking about and talking about, especially if they themselves are going through a dark patch. Now, one of the most common things we hear when the discussion of suicide is brought up, at least in our modern contexts, is that it's a selfish, selfish act. And this is very much true in a number of ways. Now, the first time I was ever really made aware of what this reality uh, to suicide really is, it came years ago, back in 2007. Now, years before that, when I was 17, I moved out for the first time, renting a room with some friends in one of these three-family apartment buildings. On the third floor above us in it lived a man named Chip, who we all came to be friends with. He was a bit of an odd bird, though, but rather eccentric and most definitely a manic sort. The highest of highs some days, followed by perhaps a week of this dreadful black pit of despair where he just dwelled. And there were substance abuse issues as well, beginning with pills and graduating later to heroin, his drinking was no help either. Now most of this was largely spurred from a whole range of personal pains and traumas which plagued him and really haunted him every day of his life. Now in 2007, two of his nephews, who were good friends of mine even to this day, and we go way back, a pair of brothers living together in a lovely apartment in Midtown Manchester. Now, the elder of the two at the time carried a 357 Magnum as his carry piece. It was a beautiful gun, too. Wood handle, a blued overall frame and cylinders. And to it, there was a curious mechanism failing. I don't know if it was something he did or just something had broken, but the chamber itself, the cylinder in the center of the gun, wouldn't spin unless it was pointed straight down. So cocking it at a normal level would just cause the hammer to go back on what was probably already an empty chamber. Now one night the two brothers are hanging out at this apartment. One is in his bedroom sorting to some personal business. The other, the elder, is in the living room watching TV. 
Now, he placed his gun on the table, took out his rounds, and placed them in a small wooden bowl at the center of the coffee table. At a certain point in the night, though, their uncle arrived, and walking in, looking, I'm told, rather depressed and disheveled, walked to the table and picked up the gun, dropped around in the chamber and closed it, pointed it straight down, pulled the hammer back, rotating the chamber. He then looked to his nephew and said, Hey, watch this, and proceeded to put the gun in his mouth and blow the back of his brains out. The younger brother fled into the room real quick and began naturally freaking out at the sight of his uncle dead on his floor, his blood and brain matter sprayed on the walls. The older of the two, who I to this day will regard as probably the coldest and most stoic man I've ever known, calmly calls 911, requests an ambulance, and even tells them to take their time as he could see that his uncle was very plainly dead. Now, a week or two later, the elder brother came to stay with me for a while and was crashing on my couch, and we'd spend most of our evenings playing video games, watching movies, and just drinking beer. I noticed, though, during the time he was staying with me, he really didn't show any signs of grief. He was his ordinary self, uh, witty, charming, active and alive, always thinking about what he was going to be doing the next day. It was one night while we were sitting around drinking that I asked him if there was anything he wanted to talk about, maybe to express some grief, which I hadn't seen him do at all. His response to me was, why would I? Fuck that guy. If he knew what he'd done to our family, especially if he'd do it again, fuck him, he's a selfish, pe selfish piece of shit, and I wouldn't want anything to do with him anyway. Now this seemed like a really harsh sentiment, and in retrospect now I can tell that it was funneling grief through anger as opposed to sadness, which is something that a good amount of people do. But it was also in this that it first dawned on me what a selfish act suicide genuinely was. Curiously, I hadn't really managed to think about this beforehand, even though I myself had come very close to putting a gun in my own mouth and ending my own life in a similar fashion. And it was in that time, and in the one time to follow, that remembering the people who loved me and the amount of pain that they would be put through kept me from going through with things. Now, with this, the question of grief is one which is exceptionally complicated. Especially in regards to suicide, grief on its own is an immensely complex and difficult matter and topic in general, especially for one going through it. Keanu Reeves, for instance, was once famously quoted as saying, Grief never really leaves you, it just changes shape. This is something which plagues many people in many different in many different respects, and the effects of a grief in respect to suicide, they can cause even greater damage sometimes than the act itself. For this, I'll just give you one other story here. From back in my years in high school. Now, mind you, this was back in the 90s, so things were a bit different then. And I'm going to use the name Bryce for this individual. Now, in high school, Bryce was the first introduction I ever had to the what we now call the LGBT set. Now, he was an openly and flamboyantly gay boy, all the way from middle school right up through high school. Now, in the latter years of high school, he actually began transitioning. He adopted a new name and ended up um, getting some surgery and some hormone therapies and began the process of transitioning into a woman. Now, naturally, it could be expected there were considerable amounts of bullies around the school, some outright cruel and, and torturous just for their own simple chuckles. This was high school in the 90s. It was a less tolerant time, I suppose you could say. But suffice it to say, at the same time, Bryce was not exclusively uh, alone in this. He actually maintained a healthy circle of friends, of which for a while I counted myself one. D to be honest, probably one of the funniest people I've ever known. But as I would come to learn later, much like Chip and much like many other people that I would know who would unfortunately go down the dark road of ending their own lives, those smiles were oftentimes just masking a deep well of pain. Now, it was after high school, some years after high school, while still transitioning, that I would find out that Bryce, uh, who was going by a different name then and um, identifying as female, hanged themselves. Um, now, whether or not this was due to hormonal imbalances, general mental illness, or something else, I can't say. But shortly after Bryce's death, his younger brother overdosed on heroin. 
Now, whether or not that overdose was in a simple accidental overdose or if it was an intentional effort to end his own life, which he too struggled with severe depression, again, I can't say. But one thing I do know is that shortly after the boys were gone, their single mother, the last living member of their family, took her own life as well. It is a tragedy that is almost as poetic as it is horrific. But this entire family is gone. Gone, rooted largely in the grief over the loss of another. And the reason that I bring this up is because the nature of grief surrounding suicide is something unlike anything else. Now, I've burned and buried enough of my own friends, and I, well, more than I'd really care to think about. And the causes of death were widely varied, with only a couple suicides involved. Everything from sickness and accidents up through manslaughter and even murder. And with each of these, the grief was processed differently, due to either the nature of the relationship I had with the person before, or the circumstances and ways in which they left this world. And for those who died of illness or in accidents, for instance, there was, a, there was a definite sadness, but a strange sort of understanding that these things just happen. As senseless as they could seem, they were not the actions of a person. No decisions were made in these cases. Something terrible simply happened, and someone died as a result. In the processing of the grief, coming to understand this reality, the, the reality to our mortality and everything around it, well, it's part of the process. It's part of the processing of the grief and the pain itself. Now, even still, in cases where deaths were caused by other people, such as in the murder of Amy Riley, a former roommate of mine from 2002, even within her murder, there was still at least a source, a cause, a readily identifiable methodology, pathology that led to her death. Now, hers was unfortunately an exceptionally brutal murder. But even then, having someone to point to and blame, understanding what their motivations were, even though they were horrible, still allowed for the death to feel like a final matter in a, in a greater sense. The processing of, the guilt, of whatever feelings of guilt or grief that may have been attached and associated there were again aided in their processing by the ability to fully understand what it was that occurred. As horrible and unnecessary as it was, it made that kind of sense. This is not something we get with suicide, typically. Typically, when one takes their own lives, even if they leave behind an encyclopedia of a suicide note explaining their reasoning, those closest to them still won't be able to fully understand. They won't be able to fully grasp what it was that caused them to go that far, and even if they do, they'll still spend the rest of their lives wondering if there was something else they could have done. If there was a way in which they could have prevented it, maybe they needed to spend more time with them. Maybe they should have called. Maybe they should have written. And all of a sudden, the death of a good friend lands in their own lap thanks to their own mind. Again, this isn't universal. But our inability to process and fully grasp the experience that might drive another person to kill themselves, especially when they were close to us, and especially when our grief wells around inside of us with more question marks than final full stops as it was that eats away at you i know because it's happened to me many times and this is the nature to this beast those who suffer most as a result of one taking their own lives are not the person who's taken their own lives their suffering is over that's usually the point but it's those around us those who are sort of denied the ability for closure because they never really know if there's something more they could have done that plus the loss of someone that they love and the realization that this person who they love so dearly was in such pain for so long and perhaps they weren't even entirely aware of it. These sorts of things linger. The reality to what Reeves said in relation to grief never really leaving us and just changing shape, you could think of it also as a whole. If you've ever lost a person who is close to you, you know that it feels like a piece of you has been ripped out, that it's gone, there's a hole somewhere in you, in your spirit as it was. And then it was filled by them, but it'll never be filled by anything else because that was their space, that was their place to be. And, and in that, that hole never really fills in, no matter how they go out. Granted, it'll get filled in over time, feel more like a little divot in the ground rather than a hole to sink your foot into but it's there and you feel it and you know it 
And rather than it being just something that you get over and move past, it's something that lingers inside you forever. The pain and the grief and the loss, the mourning that you experience, it stays with you. It gets softer. You become accustomed to it, perhaps, but it's always there. With suicide, that hole has less of a chance to ever be really filled in. That grief will continue to change shape, but oftentimes it won't really soften. Granted, people will get on with their lives, and they'll remember their friend or their family member, their loved one or their partner, as they go forward. But nothing will ever entirely be the same, and their ability to grieve and move on is greatly hampered by the reality of what went down. Suicide is indeed a selfish act, but it really mustn't be looked at so scornfully, really. Because oftentimes, all that's needed for many people is a reminder that they are too loved to be able to take themselves out in such a way. It's a re required thing that people be reminded from time to time that they matter to others, and that no one in their life or outside of it would be in any way well served by them taking their own lives. Now, I've produced this video for a number of reasons. It's one I've been wanting to get to. Um, because it is a pressing topic, and also given the fact that it is a hot question on YouTube, which isn't normally something that I go for, but given the nature of how it's come about. With Logan Paul finding a corpse in the woods, and then after taking substantial public relations flack, turning around and trying to use this platform to raise awareness about suicide and suicide prevention. Now, for the one thing I will say in regards to that is that I couldn't, while watching that video, wonder if maybe it's more of a PR move than a genuine awakening on his part, but whether or not Logan Paul is using his platform to raise awareness just to look better in the eyes of YouTube and salvage what is left of his career, or if it's a genuine, heartfelt effort to raise this awareness, either case, it's a good thing, I would say. More people need to be made aware of the nature of suicide and how it is, in many senses, a an epidemic in many parts and in many cultures and communities. But moreover than that, and more pressing, to be honest with you, the reason I finally came around to making this video is that there are those amongst you who I know. There are those amongst my own circles of friends in the real meat world here. And even myself, not too recently, but recently enough to warrant it, have found themselves battling ideation. This is the, um, the thinking of killing oneself, imagining it. And I know, even now, there are numbers of people who are struggling and suffering through this. And to those people, I would say, firstly, get the help that you need. But beyond even this, and perhaps most importantly, don't forget about those who love you. Because they will be the ones to suffer the most. And no amount of your own thinking that they'd be better off without you is going to change that fact, because I can tell you flat out and right now, no one in your life would be better off if you were dead. If you or someone you love is considering self-harm or suicide, once again, there are links down in the description, as well as phone numbers, resources that you can access around the clock in many cases. Because the help that you need is out there and it is worth getting, if not for your sake, then for the sake of those who love you. Because, though you may be going through the dark time now, in which you feel your life just isn't worth living, or that you are such a wretched piece of shit that the world would be better off without you, this passes. If anything, let me be living proof. So thank you to everybody who's stuck through and watched this video. It's not an easy one. I do promise that future content will be lighter in general, but this was a topic worth addressing. So thank you to my remaining and sustaining subscribers. A thank you to my patrons and those who support this channel through other means. Give a like or a dislike your thoughts in the comment section, please. Um, if you've gone through this yourself, or if you're going through this yourself, feel free to reach out, either directly to me or anyone else you trust. Um, but yeah, leave a comment below if you have any experience with this. In the meantime, I'm going to forego the standard credits here, and I'm actually going to be putting something that might, uh, well, we'll see what it does, but um, I'm going to be putting this video here. It's a clip from a television show I like called The Blacklist. Many of you are probably familiar with it, but in this scene, James Spader's character, Raymond Reddington, pretty much sums up everything I've been trying to say here rather beautifully. So, to all of you, thank you again, and I'll see you in the next video. Um, no, be well.
Have you ever seen the aftermath of a suicide bomber? We're wasting time. I have. June 29th, 2003. I was meeting two associates at the Marouche restaurant in Tel Aviv. As my car was pulling off, a 20-year-old Palestinian named Ghazi Safar entered the restaurant and detonated a vest wired with C4. The shockwave knocked me flat, blew out my eardrums. I couldn't hear the smoke. It was like being underwater. I went inside, a nightmare, blood, parts of people. You could tell where Safar was standing when the vest blew. It was like a perfect circle of death. There was almost nothing left of the people closest to him. 17 dead, 46 injured, blown to pieces. The closer they were to the bomber, the more horrific the effect. That's every suicide. Every single one. An act of terror perpetrated against everyone who's ever known you. Everyone who's ever loved you. The people closest to you. The ones who cherish you are the ones who suffer the most pain, the most damage. Why would you 